Okay. Thank you, Chairperson, for the introduction. My name is Ito. I'm from Tokyo University of Technology. Currently, I'm in Tokyo, about 10,000 kilometers away from Barcelona. I would like to thank you for giving me this valuable opportunity to present my research, even though we are so far away from each other. The title of my presentation today is Fabrication of Webguides with High Optical Confinement and Application to Future High Capacity Networks. In the first half of the talk, I will discuss the development of high performance waveguides for high speed, large capacity communication. And in the second half, I will discuss the communication of healthcare and biological data in an environment where high speed networks are realized. The contents are as follows. First, an introduction. I will discuss the background and objectives. Next, I will talk about the fabrication of waveguides, including the development history of three types of waveguides with different characteristics, the problems, and the status of problem solving. Next, as an application of the technology, I will discuss the status of trial experiments being conducted on data from high-speed large capacity networks, as well as methods and applications for acquiring healthcare data on a daily basis. Finally, I will summarize. First, allow me to give you an introduction. I will explain the composition of the optical network in Japan as a whole. First, there is a nationwide long haul network of uh, 100 kilometer or more. Oh, oh, sorry, oops, sorry. Uh, which is also called the core network. Second, there is the metro network which is an intercity telecommunication network of approximately 40 kilometer to 100 kilometer at the prefectural level. Next, there is the H network, which is an intercity. Uh, finally, there is the access network, which is runs from the telecommunications office building to each business to home. First, PLC devices, which are silica-based planar lightwave circuits, are used in various places in today's optical networks. In recent years, there has been growing demand for lower cost, smaller size, and higher integration of PLC devices, which has necess necessity Stated the development of PLC devices using so called extremely high delta materials with a high refractive index difference delta to achieve a sub millimeter bending radius. In this research, we have fabricated three such candidates uh, silicon dioxide, tantal pentoxide waveguides, silicon nitride waveguides, and silicon dioxide, hafnium dioxide waveguides. However, each has its own issues. Therefore, the purpose of this study is to examine the challenges and solutions in fabricating these three types of extremely high delta waveguides and to explore their applicability for practical devices. Here, I will briefly discuss the direction we are pursuing to achieve extremely high delta wave guides. This figure shows the current position of the device using the three axes of refractive index difference delta 
chip size and optical properties. As you can see, uh, if we take the axis of the reflective index or the reflective index difference delta, here, the axis of chip size here, and the axis of optical characteristics here, we can see the following three axes. We are currently located in this area, but we are aiming for this area in the future. In other words, we are aiming for a smaller size and higher delta while maintaining good optical characteristics. In the delta range, we are aiming for approximately 5% to 10%. Next, I will discuss how to fabricate such a waveguide with strong optical confinement. I will briefly introduce fabrication challenges and their solutions for three types of waveguides made of different materials as extremely high delta waveguides. First, I will discuss silicon dioxide, tantal pentoxide waveguides. This is the process of fabricating silicon dioxide, tantal pentoxide waveguides. First, and the cladding is developed uh, on a silicon substrate and silicon dioxide, tantal pentoxide thin films are deposited by coarse patterning. Then heat treatment is performed to densify and improve the quality of the quartz glass. Next, the core is processed through photolithography and dry etching process. Finally, an overcrating is deposited using the CVD, chemical vapor deposition method, to embed the core followed by heat treatment. Next, we used transmission electron microscopy, TEM, to observe the core cross-section of a 10% delta waveguide at different heat treatment temperatures. The horizontal axis show the heat uh, treatment temperature, and the vertical axis show the propagation loss. As you can see, there is no particular problem with the cross section in the 900 degrees Celsius heat treated waveguide, which has very low propagation loss. However, in the 1000 and 130 degrees Celsius heat treated waveguide, a particular like material was observed inside. Further examination of the electron deflection pattern showed no problem in the 900 degrees Celsius heat treatment. However, a pattern indicating crystallization was observed in the 1000 and 130 degrees Celsius heat treatment indicating that crystallization progresses at the core overcrowding boundary at this temperature and that these crystallized particles are a factor in reducing the propagation loss. In devices made of quartz glass, the high temperature heat treatment process is necessary to densify and improve the quality of the glass film so it is necessary to devise ways to prevent crystallization even after heat treatment. One way to prevent crystallization during heat treatment is to double layer the overcrowding, double layer cladding technology. Compositional analysis of the inside of the 10% delta wave guide that is crystallized as described above showed that boron and phosphorus, which are dopants of the overcrowding, have penetrated into the core. It is thought that the diffusion of boron and phosphorus promotes crystallization inside. We came up with this idea. The first layer is a very thin silicon dioxide film uh, 
0.9 m i c r o m e t e r t h i c k The second layer has a double layer structure with a 10 micrometer thickness of ordinary PPSA. In other words, the first layer of silicon dioxide film prevents the diffusion of boron and phosphorus and avoids crystallization inside the core. The following figure shows the relationship between the heat treatment temperature and the propagation loss of a waveguide fabricated by this double layer cladding technology and cross sectional temp observation of the core. The horizontal axis shows the heat treatment temperature and the, oops. And the vertical axis show the propagation loss. On the other hand, the waveguide with a double layer structure has low loss up to 1,100 degrees Celsius heat treatment. However, the loss begins to increase at 1,130 degrees Celsius heat treatment. Suggesting that the heat treatment process is improved by about 100 degrees Celsius due to the shutout effect of boron and phosphorus by the insertion of silicon dioxide in the first layer. Here is a cross sectional term photograph of a 1030 degrees Celsius heat treated waveguide with a normal structure. And Here is a cross section of TEM photograph of a 1030 degrees Celsius heat treated waveguide with a double layer structure. As you can see, the signs of crystallization outside the core of the normal structure are not seen in the double layer structure, indicating the crystallization suppression effect of the double layer technology. At least, heat treatment for the densification and Higher quality of the quartz glass film was hardly a problem up to 1030 degrees Celsius, and the propagation loss was greatly improved from 0.66 dB per centimeter to 0.06 dB per centimeter after 1100 degrees Celsius heat treatment. Next, I will discuss silicon oxynitrite waveguides. Silicon oxynitrite waveguides have a long research history. However, let us briefly review the history of our research to date. We have been studying extremely high delta silicon oxynitrite waveguides fabricated by sputtering and when comparing optical properties by the deposition method. If we take the、uh, wavelengths on the horizontal axis and the、uh, propagation loss on the vertical axis, we find that the、uh, propagation loss can be reduced by bias application in single sputtering, co sputtering, and bias applied co sputtering. On the other hand, The NH group absorption that occurs in the communication wavelength band around 1500 nanometer tends to increase. Therefore, we are considering the following measures to reduce absorption loss and improve the quality of extremely high delta silicon oxynitride waveguides. First, improve the heat treatment processes. Second, achieve high temperature and long term heat treatment. We searched for the key points by conducting ex experiments under different conditions for the above two points. This is a process of fabricating silicon oxynitride waveguides. Two heat treatment processes are prepared to densify and improve the quality of silica based glasses. And different conditions are applied to waveguide A and applied waveguide B. First, and cladding is deposited, deposited by a、uh, coarse sputtering. The subsequent heat 
treatment process is the same for both waveguides A and waveguide B. <coughs> Next, the core is processed through photolithography and dry etching processes. After this, waveguide A is left as it is, and only waveguide B is heat treated. <coughs> Finally, overcrowding is deposited using the CBT method to embed the core. After this, only waveguide A is heat treated, while waveguide B is left untreated. Oops, oops. The two waveguides are heat treated differently before and after the overcrowding deposition to investigate the differences in their optical properties. This shows the relationship between wavelengths and propagation loss for waveguide B, which is heat treated before overcrowding is deposited. We found that there is a significant change in this relationship when the heat treatment time is buried. <clears throat> the, absorption the absorption of the NH group at around 1,500 nanometer can be reduced by increasing the heat treatment time to 6, 12, and 47 hours, as shown in this figure. In other words, longer heat treatment time reduces the absorption of NH groups and propagation loss. There was no bubble formation after 47 hours of heat treatment. These two points were confirmed. Finally, I will discuss silicon dioxide and hafnium dioxide waveguides. To start, I will discuss the problems in fabricating extremely high delta waveguides using germanium dioxide material. Also, silicon dioxide, germanium dioxide waveguides are in common use today. One major problem is the stress glass film. The thermal expansion coefficient of the silicon dioxide, germanium dioxide film increases linearly with the germanium dioxide content of the material. Oops. For core films with a thermal expansion coefficient of 2.5% delta or higher, the glass film becomes unstable due to tensile stress, and there is a risk of film delamination, which makes it difficult to fabricate an extremely high delta waveguide. Therefore, to solve this problem, the change tensile stress can be suppressed by adding a material with a small coefficient of thermal expansion. We will look at the properties of each additive material that is a candidate for uh, fabricating extremely high delta waveguides. Thus, a uh, comparison is made for each material in terms of reflective index coefficient of thermal expansion and melting point. Next, we would like to consider tin dioxide and hafnium dioxide, which have negative thermal expansion coefficient. The process of fabricating silicon dioxide, hafnium dioxide, and silicon dioxide, tin dioxide waveguides is as follows. This process is similar to the normal process of fabricating silicon dioxide, germanium dioxide waveguides. Let us look at the propagation loss of the silicon dioxide, tin dioxide, and silicon dioxide, hafnium dioxide waveguides, fabricated in the previous step. The wavelength is on the horizontal axis, and the propagation loss is on the vertical axis. The silicon dioxide, the tin dioxide waveguide, has a propagation loss of 0 0.19. 
to 0.23 dB per centimeter in the 1,200 nanometer to 1,700 nanometer wavelength band, which is much higher than that of other waveguides. The silicon dioxide, half name dioxide waveguides, has a propagation loss of 0.07 to 0.1 dB per centimeter in the 1,200 nanometer to 1,700 nanometer wavelength band which is similar to that of other waveguides, indicating a low loss waveguide. The propagation loss does not increase on the low loss side, suggesting that crystallization has not occurred. The silicon dioxide, half name dioxide waveguide is promising as an extremely high delta waveguide because a low loss waveguide can be realized under high compressive stress. Next, I will talk about application focusing on the actual use of data communication instead of devices that have been used to achieve high-speed, large capab capacity communication. I will talk about a case study of a joint demonstration experiment between NTT East, which is a Japanese largest, one of the largest company, and the local government to realize telecom telemedicine using ICT in Hinoemata village, Fukushima prefecture, where there is no specialist doctor in the village. The objective is to build a system for monitoring the health of residents in order to create a village where the elderly can continue to live with peace of mind in the current aging society with a declining birth rate. Through an optical network called the Community Health Support Network for the purpose of promoting residents' health and preventing diseases. Let me turn to biological data, which is health management data. For example, uh, daily or weekly data may be sufficient for normal health management. But when managing data that changes on a daily basis, it is generally necessary to measure biological signals that can be easily measured. Such easily measurable biological signals include, for example, those currently available for brain waves, EEG, heart rate, and salivary amylase. These are non invasive measurements that do not place a burden on the body. Next, I would like to talk about wearable sensors that can easily acquire the biological signals that we actually need to measure in our daily lives. For example, using an undershirt with embedded electrodes like this, a heart rate signal an important biological signal can be transmitted to a cell phone via Bluetooth communication using a transmitter. This signal can be managed through the cloud, support healthcare and medical di diagnostic support, and so on. Next, I will discuss wearable devices that can easily measure brain waves. This is one of the simplified EEG measurement devices, a headset type device called MindWave Mobile by Neurosky. Instead of covering the entire scrap as in the past, the signal is acquired from electrodes on the forehead, collected, and the noise is eliminated. Next, I would like to present some examples of recent measurements we have taken. As task one, we measured changes in heart rate during bike exercise and cerebellar amylase, which indicates the state of stress while wearing a mask, one of the most important tools used recently to fight infection. The masks used here were a non woven mask like this,
a cross mask, a ureter mask, and a sports mask. Exercise was performed at a gradually increasing load of uh, 12 watt per minute. After seven minutes, the exercise was stopped to allow the heart rate to decrease spontaneously. Here are the results of the experiment. Here are subject age typical heart rate changes during exercise. Time is shown on the horizontal axis and heart rate is shown on the vertical axis. Heart rate changes are compared when wearing four different masks. We can see that without the mask, the heart rate is the lowest, five to 10% lower. No significant differences between masks were observed. This may be due to the fact that most masks are designed to be breathable to prevent suffocation. <laughs> Next, I would like to present a second example of recent measurements we made. In task two, we measured brain waves during light exercise and the card game. For the light exercise, we chose Moruki, a new sport that originated in Finland, so that the subject's strengths and weakness would not be apparent. The card game was Jinra. Here are the result of the experiment. This is the change over time in the EEGs during light exercise while playing Moruki. Taking time on the horizontal axis and brainwave intensity on the vertical axis, we compare the fluctuation of the alpha and beta wave weighted index of the actual winner and losers. As you can see, completely different waveforms were obtained for the two groups. In subject B, the winner, the alpha wave weighted index is always higher than the beta wave weighted index. On the other hand, in subject C, the loser, both alpha and beta wave weighted index remained at the same level. <coughs> Next, I would like to present a third example of recent measurements we made. In task three, we evaluate honesty based on a initial effect using biological information. What is an honest person in society? This person will not be vainly trying to make himself look great and will not hide his mistakes and failures, but will admit them. An interesting report indicates that the napping 15 minutes of sleep in the afternoon conducted by Fukuoka Prefectural Meizen High School is effective in increasing the efficiency of afternoon classes. The purpose of this study is to quantitatively evaluate honesty by examining the change in performance due to the initial effect of providing false information about the post-nap performance enhancement known to be effective. Here are the result of the experiment. This is a change over time in the EEG while performing domino. Here is the flow of the experiment, a comparison of each group's low performance percentage for each waiting period with the honesty rating on the questionnaire showed agreement between the two, confirming the analogy between levels of honesty. Next, I would like to present a fourth example of recent measurements we made. In task four, the purpose of this study is to evaluate the performance enhancing effects of warming up by measuring and analyzing biological signals for physical or mental or both related tasks under different conditions. Here are the results of the experiment. This is a change over time in the EEG while performing domino. Here is beta wave intensity over alpha wave intensity 
of left EEG data. The average beta wave intensity over alpha wave intensity integral value decreases in performance from the warm-up period. Relief of tension and relaxation in production. The average of beta wave intensity over alpha wave intensity integral values in the actual performance is lower after the warm-up time when practicing. Familiarity and experience influence other than warming up. Let me summarize what I have said so far. I'd like to summarize as follows. First half, high optical confinement waveguides in the silicon dioxide, tantal pentoxide waveguides. Crystallization was a problem, but low loss waveguides were achieved using double layer overcrowding technology. In silicon oxynitride waveguides, low loss waveguides were achieved by improving the heat treatment process to reduce NH group absorption. For silicon dioxide, hafnium dioxide waveguides, a material system with a negative thermal expansion coefficient was used to enhance film stability and achieve low loss waveguides. This technology will be great help in making devices smaller and of higher quality. Second half, healthcare data transmission, application of biological signals using wearable devices, brain waves, heart rate, saliva amylase. These non-invasive, easily measurable biological signals can be used for exercise management, health management, medical diagnostics, and other applications. In a high-speed, high Capacity communication society, there are likely to be even more opportunity to use this technology in the future. I would like to thank the following people for their cooperation and support in this research. NTT Laboratories, Makoto Abe, Mikitaka Ito, Toshimi Kominato, Masahiro Yanagisawa, and Matsuyuki Ogasawa. Tokyo University of Technologies, Takashi Nakayama, Mami Ito, Yudai Oka, Hiroto Kumagai, and Yuka Gomi. All other members of the Ito Laboratory for their cooperation. Thank you for listening. If you are interested in learning more, please do not hesitate to contact me at this email address. Thank you.